So if you're like me, school is out for the summer in a couple of weeks. And what you're going to be doing right now is the end of the year testing when it comes to speech sound disorders. So I would like to share with you today three reasons why you may get dismal results with some children. Why is it that some children go from a 50 standard score to a 100 standard score in a school year, very severe speech impairment, to normal at the end of the school year? And why is it that some children simply inch up so that child with a standard score of 50 is at a standard score of 60 at the end of the school year? Why are the gains so dismal? I'm going to share with you three reasons why you may get dismal gains with some children when you're treating speech sound disorders, even though you are doing everything right. It's not you. It's not about speech. It's much bigger than that. This is where we're going to have to take a step back and we're going to have to look at the big picture if we want these children to be successful. So this is the episode for you if you work on treating speech sound disorders at the preschool or elementary age, because I know that you work with these kiddos and I'm going to share with you today how you can overcome these three obstacles. I know you've been there, you've done that, and I'm going to help you by learning from my failures and my successes, how to do that better. The first obstacle we're going to share is a sensitive temperament. If the child has a sensitive temperament, that's going to impact therapy because they're often reluctant to speak. And we really do need these children actually speaking in order for their speech to improve. We can't do their push-ups for them. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to invest a lot of time and energy in the first month or two building a relationship. And how are we going to do that? We're going to find out from my speech sound disorders book. I have a parent input form. Get that parent input form. Find out what the child loves. What's the child's favorite toys? What's their favorite music? What's their favorite movies? Invest in all of those things the child loves. And you are going to be like a bubblegum dispenser that dispenses what the child loves to build rapport. So you're going to spend a lot of your energy building a relationship early on, and you're going to slowly fade in the demands. So you're going to have to go through the back door, not the front door, in order for this to happen. It's going to pay off exponentially down the road. Trust me, I've been there. I've done that. I have very fun, really engaging activities. And in the past, I've just thought, come on, let's go. And when children come in from day one, I'm ready to say, pop. Let's pop right into action. And some children take time to warm. And there's nothing wrong with that. Embrace that. Take that time to warm so that the child feels comfortable with you, so that the child feels safe with you and secure with you, so that the child feels actually confident with you. Because you want the child feeling confident so that the child is actually going to perform at their challenge point in speech therapy, in which they are actually trying words and fat they're not sure that they can handle. You want them to have that level of confidence and trust so that they feel safe and secure enough to stick their neck out in speech therapy. What you're going to do in this case when the child has a sensitive temperament, and that's why my scale is so important. It's in my speech sound disorder textbook. What you see in that scale is the questions about the temperament. Secondly, we ask the questions about everything the child loves. You, that is what you're going to need in order to build a strong foundation from which you can have a great working relationship. So I've tried in the past to, because I am, I have to know my weaknesses in being a therapist. And one of my weaknesses is that I'm very results oriented. I'm very much like, okay, I only have 30 minutes a week with you. I want to, I'm here to create change. Your neuroplasticity in the brain is at this highest level. Come on, chop, chop, let's go. And some children, you have to take a breath and you have to be patient and you have to say, let's build a relationship. And that's where my focus needs to be, 100% on building a relationship. And only after I have a relationship built with this child with a sensitive temperament can I then fade in the speech therapy and the excellent techniques that we use with the multimodal cueing. I am not a fan of auditory bombardment. 
It simply does not have the research. I do not think you should go and say, I'm going to talk the whole time and the child's going to learn how to say their sounds correctly. And the research is simply not there to support that. What I want you to do is focus on building that relationship. And after that relationship is built, then you're going to slowly fade in through the back door, the speech practice. Okay. So that is number one. Reason number one is a sensitive temperament, and we are going to overcome that, and we are going to help these children thrive by investing our time and our energy in building a relationship. So relationships first. Then after we've built a relationship, we can focus on the speech sound disorder. The second reason the child might be making dismal gains is attention. So some of our children have attentional challenges. And what I want you to do is I want you to not be dismayed when you don't see the gains on the standardized testing. Our children with attentional challenges, they test very Orally. So these are the children in therapy. We're doing all the right things. The child is saying complex clusters. The child is doing the cueing. The child is at a level of independence. The child is beginning to self-monitor in therapy. And then you take out a text manual, text testing book manual, in which the child is saying the words of the page. The child is literally, because of their attentional difficulties, tearing your book apart ripping out the pages, yelling out the words in a silly voice, blah, 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 blah. Sounds a bit like that. And they're ruining your testing manual. They don't test well. Does that mean they're not learning? No. What you're going to find with these children is keep your eyes on the prize and stay in the moment. And what you're going to do in therapy is you're going to provide multimodal cueing and you're going to always, always make sure that the child's at an 80% accuracy level. So it's like a dance. If you're losing the child's attention after a turn or two and the child's like starting to do silly voice or whatever, you are going to pull out your tools and you're going to carry the child's weight just like a dancer would. Okay, you're a little bit off a dance partner. I'm going to carry some of your weight here. On other times when the child is totally all in and hyper-focused, you are going to remove your support and the child's going to be in. So it's a moment-to-moment -moment basis. The key is you're always, always ensuring that the child's minimally 80% accurate. They're at that challenge point. So you need to be on your toes and making sure that you're being responsive on a moment-to-moment -moment basis because these children with attentional difficulties can be very inconsistent, okay? It's just, it comes with having attentional challenges. What you need to be is you need to be consistent at that 80% accuracy level. So I've had children, this is the way it works with them. We're in the beginning of the school year. We have a severe speech impairment. They're at the one percentile. And then I'll test them every quarter. The first quarter, we see minimal improvement. The second quarter, more minimal improvement. The third quarter, more minimal improvement. The end of the school year, fireworks. And what happened is that generalization kicked in. And when it kicks in, it kicks in big. It's like ET found home. Like I knew you were in there all along. They look at that, they look at you one day, and suddenly this child looks at me and says, Hi. And this is a child that's stopping. This is a child that's fronting. This is a child that's doing final constant deletion. And they'll say my name really clearly, Miss Kelly. What happened? And it happens overnight. So true to their very nature, <clears throat> you're going to find these children with attentional challenges going to test poorly. They're going to, with consistency, with the parent every single day for two minutes doing their home practice, with you every single session doing the 80%, always doing the 80% accuracy and, and providing the tools on a moment to moment basis in the, in the multimodal scaffolding and pushing them and fading out your tools as much as possible. You're going to find <clears throat> that with these children overnight, there is sort of this fireworks moment in which it all clicks. And then suddenly they're not stopping they're not fronting, they're not even gliding, they're not doing final consonant deletion, they're not doing cluster reduction, and it happens like all overnight.
That is what I find with children with attentional challenges. The key in working with these children is to be present and to worry about the present. And in the present, always ensure that they're at an 80% minimal uh, accuracy rate at all times and that you're challenging them. Okay, so and that you're challenging them and they're you're using multimodal cueing. And these are children that need to move a lot, which is why they do so well with our task oriented movement therapy activities. Okay, and our multimodal cueing. The third reason you may see dismal gains in some of your clients, and this one is a big one, is if the child also has a concurrent language delay. And why is that? And that's because if the child has a speech delay, they're statistically more likely to have executive function difficulties, which we're going to dive into in a minute. But if they have a speech delay and a language delay, they're exponentially more likely to have executive function difficulties. So what are those executive function difficulties? We can think of three core difficulties. Difficulty in maintaining and sustaining attention, as we talked about in the last one, that will impact your ability to perform a complex motor movement and to change uh, persistent habits. The second one that they have difficulty with is working memory. So when you think about verbal working memory, and particularly, this is a hallmark that you're going to find is, is a difficulty for children with language pretty much across the board, all ages, this is a hallmark challenge, is verbal working memory. And that's ability to not only be able to know what you're going to say, right, but you're working it, you're also thinking about how you're going to say it. So you can see these children with this working memory difficulty. This is how it manifests it. They will have persistent error patterns. So they're doing stopping and fronting in elementary school. So the children with language delays, that executive function difficulty, that difficulty of which, okay, I'm going to make the snake sound now. So I'm going to continue the airflow and I'm going to flow into the next word. Instead of saying done, I'm going to say on. I'm thinking about how I'm talking. I'm saying a word and I'm also thinking about how I'm talking. It's very much a verbal working memory task retrieving the word, and you're also thinking about how you're producing the word, two things you're doing here. This kind of task is going to be difficult for a child with a language delay. So what you see as these phonological processes that most children grow out of as they go into elementary school, the children with executive function difficulties, secondary to the language impairment, these children are going to persist. So they're still stopping fricative sounds and affricate sounds. They're still fronting. There's still cluster reduction. These rules are persisting into elementary age. So that is another error problem that we're going to see is that when you have that concurrent language delay, you're going to see that the gains are going to be more dismal. Now let's talk about another thing that you're going to see. Some children have executive function difficulties in the sense of cognitive flexibility. These are children that are like, no, I always need to have this red plate, not the blue plate. They, they have these rules about how they like things just so. I need to have this teddy bear and it goes in this chair, that lack of flexibility. Now I've worked with these children as well, and they have a rule and they, the rule might be you delete the last sound of every word. And that's just what you do hundred percent of the time. And these children, it can be very difficult for them to make gains. Even if in therapy, you're doing it correctly because they have a rule. When I talk, I'm going to delete the end of the sound. And that's period. These are also the children that will tend to like skip numbers. They'll say like one, two, three, four, six, and they'll never say the number five, 20, 24, 26. They have these cognitive flexibility issues and they manifest in other areas of their life as well. 
These children with cognitive flexibility issues in their speech, a lot of them will have atypical errors. Now, atypical errors is when you're actually saying something harder for an earlier developing sound. You're breaking the rules of language. And they'll be saying, for instance, instead of the word pig, they'll say rig. So anytime you have a P, they'll make it, make it an R. Now, R's are much more difficult than P's, but it's just this atypical error, and it's very hard to change. And a lot of times underneath that, there could be a cognitive flexibility issue where it's like, I produce R for P's, and that's just it. That's my rule. And it's not governed by the rules of our language, and it's atypical. So it's not uh, governed by rules of maturity or... Um, or, or ease. It's more, they're saying a more complex sound for an easier one. So for these children, what I want you to think about is we need to treat the language impairment as well as the speech impairment. And that's why I know that what I do is very, very different, but that's why it's very, very effective. And I'm talking about paragraphs when we talk about treating speech sound disorders. The treatment target is not a sentence. It's not a word and it's not a phrase. It's definitely not a syllable and definitely not a sound. I'm working at the paragraph level. And the reason we're working at the paragraph level, if you're working with me, is because we're improving verbal working memory. So this child is going to sequence four sentences together in a paragraph form that contain complex clusters. So I'm not only improving the speech, I'm also improving the language. So I get two for the price of one. And what our research found is when you embed these clusters in a paragraph, instead of embedding them in a sentence, not only you're gonna get better gains in the language, you're gonna get a higher MLU, you're also going to get better gains in the speech. Because when you improve the verbal working memory, the child's also going to remember every syllable that they say in the word fingernail, for instance. That's four separate syllables. They're going to, that's almost like taking four separate words and putting them in order and saying that. Now, a child with a language impairment or poor verbal working memory might say, la, la, la. And they might do repetition, repetition of a sound. And part of that is more of speech motor. But part of that is also language, that they're not able to sequence those four separate syllables and put them into order. So what you're looking at here is more than speech. It has to do with the language impairment and the language impairment's impact on the child's gains. How are you going to overcome this obstacle? I would say, do what I do. And what I do is I work at the paragraph level with my speech sound disorders. I get two for the price of one. I improve speech better than as if I was working at a simple syntax level. I also improve language. So that way I also improve the child's verbal working memory, which is not only important for speech and language, but it's important for all aspects of learning and particularly important for storytelling abilities, which I think is the most crucial skill of all is the ability to tell a story because we learn from stories about ourselves and about others. So those are the three reasons. You may get dismal gains if you're here with me at the drawing board and you're doing the end of the year speech testing. Those are them. And I've given you ways that you can overcome them. So in summary, the first reason is a sensitive temperament that will impact your gains if the child is reluctant to speak. What are you going to do? You are going to build on building a relationship. You're going to put your eggs, all of your eggs, in the relationship building basket. After a strong relationship is developed, you're going to go through the back door and you're going to elicit speech in a fun, non-threatening manner. The second thing you're going to do is we're talking about children with attention difficulties. Those are people like me who have ADHD. With these children, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on our time with the child and we're going to focus on maintaining an 80% minimal accuracy rate at all 
times. So we're going to have to be very responsive to the child's level of attention. We're also going to incorporate movement into the therapy sessions, which is why I use the task-oriented movement therapy sessions, and they work so well with my children with speech sound disorders. Another thing that we're going to want to do is we're not going to get dismayed, and we're not going to change course when we see that the testing results gains are minimal because of the child's poor self-monitoring. The child, the worst thing that's going to happen is the child might ruin your testing manual book. They might tear a page, they might wrinkle a page in your testing manual book, but know that you are headed in the right direction if the child in therapy is producing complex clusters at 80% accuracy rate. If the child every day is seeing their complex target paragraph once a day, every single day with their parent, and it's embedded into their routine, like toothbrushing. Then trust me on this, this child's going to make big gains as well. Their big gains, however, are not like a stair step, like the other children going up the stairs. They're like fireworks. They're like, mm, how? And I hope that you get to enjoy that by the end of the school year, I have a couple of kiddos in my caseload that are like that. And I'm so happy that they're not making the gains over the summer that I'm here to see the fireworks now. And I get to test them and suddenly everything's just, it just clicks overnight. And it's really wonderful. Oh, you're saying the Fs, you're saying the Ss, you're saying the Cs, you're saying everything, you're saying the ends of the words now. You just turn a corner like that and it's fireworks, and it's wonderful. I'm sorry if you're going to miss it, but just know that you're doing the right thing if that doesn't happen until over the summer when, you, when you're going to, to get to see the fireworks for yourself. So the third reason why we talked about was if the child also has a language delay or if the child has executive function difficulties. So I've worked with children with strong language skills, but they don't have cognitive, they have cognitive flexibility issues. So these are the children that are a little bit kind of a kind of obsessive compulsive about things like you don't say this number and this needs to go there. And, and if their day is changed, if there's a change in their routine, they totally flip out. These are the children that can really hold on tight to these phonological processes, such as final consonant deletion. So in my career, I found final consonant deletion is always spontaneously remediated by using complex clusters and focusing my attention on the most complex sounds in our language. One child, there's only been one child in the last 15 years that I've been doing this where it did not spontaneously remediate. And this was a child that had cognitive flexibility issues. And his rule was no matter what, 100% of the time, you delete the last sound of every single word. And he also skipped numbers when he counted and he had other things as well where it was just but what I want you to do is I want you to know that you can DSD, you can do something different, and you are going to make dis gains despite these obstacles. You're going to overcome these obstacles. You're going to take the back door. These children, too, are going to make great gains because you're going to think outside of the box and you're going to think from a wide angle lens because we're not just treating a mouth. We're treating a child. So I want you to take all of this information roll up your sleeves and make the world a better place. One child at a time, you are always going to be first.